this awesome flight shooter game coming out for the PS4, the Xbox One, and Steam. It looks awesome, gameplay looks cool, and the soundtrack looks amazing, but there's only one problem. I haven't played any Ace Combat game yet, so I probably won't understand the story. If that's your case, don't worry, I got your back cover, bro. My name is Ace Combat Fan, and in this video I'll be explaining everything you should know before you play Ace Combat 7. This video will be divided in two parts. The first part is gonna explain the previous games, so you have a better understanding. And the second part, we'll talk more specifically about things that we got to know with the trailers and the gameplay footage, so you have a better understanding of Ace Combat 7. One of the things people think about Ace Combat before playing the game is that it's just a fly shooter, that the story is not important, but as you will see, the story is actually very important. Probably one of the best points in an Ace Combat game, as you asked fans all around. So, enough with all the explaining, let's get this started. Warning, this video contains spoilers from Ace Combat 4, Ace Combat 5 and Ace Combat 0, but not Ace Combat 6, because Ace Combat 6 has this very annoying girl, and I'm just glad she's not back in this game. Alright, so the first thing you have to know is that the Ace Combat games, they take place in this fictional universe of Stranger, which is like a very messed up version of Earth. But, there are similarities between the fictional universe and our own planet. One of the examples of these similarities is the countries. In the Stranger, we have the Union of the Ukrainian Republics, which is like the Soviet Union. We have the Federation of Osea, which is going to be a major country in Ace Combat 7, which is basically like the United States, you know, this very large superpower that fights for freedom and burgers. We also have the country of Arusia, or technically the Kingdom of Arusia, which is a mixture between France and Italy, although they don't surrender that easy or they just don't switch sides, which is a good thing for them. Which again is gonna be a major country in Ace Combat 7. And lastly, we have the country of Belk, one of the most famous countries in Stranger. So everything begins in the late 80s, where Belka was building this massive military. And what they wanted to do in building this military was defend themselves against Osea, which is like a nearby country. And so they were spending their money crazy on planes, on laser defense systems, on huge bombers and all that kind of stuff. But you know what happens when you spend so much money? You get in trouble, financial trouble. And so Belka had this massive economic crisis. And what do you do when you have an economic crisis and you don't want to stop spending on your military? Well, the Belkans thought, hey, we can just sell territory and it'll be all good. So Belka just started selling these massive territories to their neighboring countries in order to make back some money and keep their military strong. Well, that did not help and the economic crisis continued. Osea, which is Belka's neighbor, said, hey buddy, what about these natural resources here? Why don't you spend some money in, co in collaboration with me so you can maybe get some money back from the natural resources? Well, Belka spent a lot of money in these plans for mining the resources. Guess what? There were no natural resources there. That was the best Osean prank of all times. So Belka got really pissed off at Osea. And in 1995, they find out that the territories that Belka sold, they actually had natural resources. And what does Belka do? They just starting invading everyone and get everything back like in this massive Blitzkrieg attack, basically World War II. And that is the beginning of Ace Combat Zero, where Belka is just invading everyone, using their legendary air force to take over all the natural resources and territories that belong to them. And so one of these territories that they are invading is called the Republic of Usu. It's this very small country, rather weak, that was almost taken over in a couple of days. And so what does Ustio do is that, hey, our Air Force sucks. Um, let's hire some mercenaries for, so they can fight for us and hopefully everything will be good. And that is where Cypher, the protagonist of the game and Pixie, his mercenary buddy, come along and he help Ustio fight for its freedom. The two of them are members of the GOM Squadron, the 66 Air Force unit of the 66 Air Division, which you get the reference 666, basically. So they just fight the war and they make Belka run away from them because they are so good. They, like literally one guy can change the title of the war because, well, it's an Ace Combat game, that's what it happens. And so Belka is now on, on the defensive because the Allies, they, they, they don't want peace. They just want to take back the, the land from Belka now. They, aren't, they weren't satisfied with just freeing their territory. They started bombing Belka, bombing the civilians, committing all those war crimes, as, as you know, it happens sometimes in wars. And Belka was just pissed off. 
Belka was not able to hold the front lines. So what do you think Belka does? A. They keep fighting in the war and hope the tide will change in their favor. B. They ask for peace. C. They develop a new weapon or technology that will help them change the tide of the war. Or D. They just nuke themselves. You have 5 seconds to choose an option. So if you pick D, good job, congratulations, because Belkin nuked itself, not just one time, but seven times. June 6th, 1995. Maybe their old militaristic leaders couldn't stand the idea of allied forces invading their land and declared to the world that the land to the north was the holy land of Belka. According to official records, more than 12,000 people died. And why they did that? Just to casually hold the Allied fence, because, well, we can't trespass a mountainous region that was just nuked seven times, right? And this detonation of nukes makes Cypher's buddy, Dixie, go all mentally crazy and he disappears. In the mission. And so the war comes to an end and everything is like, oh yeah, so good, the war is finally ended, it's gonna be peace now, but hey, Pixie comes back, actually he betrays Cypher and becomes a member of a War of No Boundaries, this terrorist organization that wants to abolish and erase all borders so there are no more conflicts in humanity because can't fight for borders, there are no borders. And so their plan is to eliminate the borders by again nuking everyone, just like the Balkans did. And Cypher goes and defeats them, this terrorist organization. And that is the end of Ace Combat Zero. And so you would think that after finishing this World War II, but with seven nukes, the world would be in peace, no one would want wars, and everything would be a bright and promising future for humanity. Well, that's not really what happened, because this is strange. So, some countries they discovered there was this big ass asteroid called Ulysses that was about to hit the planet. So they were wondering, oh man, what can we do now? Like we thought everything was gonna be good, but now we have to prepare for this massive asteroid that's gonna hit us. So what do you think they do? A, they just pray that the asteroid's not gonna hit them. B, they do some parties to celebrate the end of the war and have fun in the last moments. C, they build some underground shelters to protect them from the impact. Or D, they build large railguns capable of intercepting and destroying the fragments of the asteroid, but they are so big and so large and so complex, they probably won't get ready in time, and even if they do, they can probably be used as anti-aircraft guns that could probably put the region into another conflict after the asteroid hits the planet. Well, it is no surprise that the answer is D. So they built this structure called Stonehenge, capable of intercepting fragments of Ulysses, with eight large turrets and they did, the asteroid came and they weren't that successful but they did destroy some fragments and so there were these large fragments of the asteroid still hitting the planet and killing a bunch of people, destroying infrastructure, houses, little cats, everything you can imagine. And so once more the world of Stranger became a chaos where there was hunger, poverty, refugees the refugee situation was so bad, in particular the continent of Yuzia, this one right here, it was it was basically like the Syrian refugees times 10,000. It, it was bad. It was bad. And so the countries organizing Yuzia were like, hey, let's all do our part. And so, Rusia, you're a big power, right? You take more refugees. And they kept pushing refugees. Rusia, get more. Get more, Rusia. You can do it. You can do it, bro. 
But then Naruto wasn't that wasn't that happy, and they said no. We don't want any more. Enough is enough. Seriously. And so Arusha built the wall so the refugees couldn't come in. And the other countries got pissed. Like, hey Arusha, you're so such a good country. You have the industry. Go, Kasab, accept more. If you don't, we're gonna start economic warfare on you. We're gonna stop buying your goods. We're gonna do other sanctions. You're not gonna get the raw materials. We're gonna mess you up if you don't take the refugees. Dude, Arusha was not happy. So what did they do? They just attacked and got stone engine and started using it as an anti-aircraft gun. So they could say, no, we're not getting more refugees. Although they kind of went overboard and invaded the, pretty much the entire continent. Four years after the planet fall of the Ulysses 1994 XF-04 asteroids, Stonehenge, the erosion weapon of mass destruction, was originally built to shoot down asteroids. Upon discovering its potential as an anti-aircraft weapon, the erosions ruled the skies over the mainland. The ISAF's attempts to destroy Stonehenge through airstrikes failed. As a result, strategic positions on the mainland were lost. This in turn forced ISAF to evacuate from the east coast to North Point. And this is the beginning of the East Coast War, where we play as Mobius One, leader of the Mobius Squadron and part of ISAF, the Independent States Armed Forces, or basically these bunch of countries that got invaded by Arusia. Now the one thing that is interesting about H-14 is that Mobius One he fights single-handedly, that is, without any wingmen towards you know recapturing or freeing the continent of Usia. And one of the most important points in H-14 is this rivalry between Mobius One and the Yellow Squadron, Arusia's elite fighter squadron, whose task is to defend Stonehenge against enemy air attacks. A freeway under construction in a wheat field outside of town. When they started construction, I remember how the mayor bragged about it, even though it would completely bypass our town. The freeway became the occupation force's makeshift runway, and the unfinished tunnels their bunkers. This was their base. They were the elite flight squadron chosen to protect the cannon. Ironically, the same cannon that was created to shoot down the asteroids became a catalyst to the war. But when the Allied attacks no longer came, the squadron was assigned long-range missions that took them to distant battlefields. However, needless to say, Mobius One goes there, destroys Stonehenge, and there is this epic fights between him and the Yellow Squadron. Most importantly, between him and Yellow Thirteen, who is the leader of the Yellow Squadron. And you might think the Yellow Squadron are like you know just a bunch of bad guys, but actually. That's not really the truth. The Alec 13 is actually a nice guy. I believe it was their custom to call a pilot an ace once he shot down five planes. After completing the day's review, the same guy, the squadron agent, went on to announce, and now, for our leader's results, everyone turned around to look at the quiet man who sat alone, strumming a guitar. I found myself drawn to the music from his guitar. Our Yellow 13 bagged three more today, bringing his new tally up to 64 kills. The pillar of their group, 13 exuded an air of invincibility. He always chose to fly a five-plane formation. He was a man who prided himself not on his kill record, but on his record of never losing a squadron member. He's so nice that you actually feel bad when he gets shot down. And that happens in the siege of Farbani when ISAF is, you know, has fought all over the continent and finally gets the erosion capital, which is named Farbani. And so they have this fight there, Mobius One is there, destroys the Yellow Squadron, and the war is almost over. However, some young erosion officers, they end up escaping from the capital and they go to Megalith, this secret facility that houses ICBMs packed with nukes. And their goal is just, you know, just to nuke everyone back again just for retaliation, because why not? And so Mobius One, in the last mission of the game, he is dispatched towards Megalith to destroy that facility. Just check this out. Now, 
now you tell me if there's any game that has a better intro for a mission than like that. But of course, our Lord and Savior Mobius One goes there and destroys Megalith. And that is the end of the second New Zealand Continental War in the year of 2005. But the story of Arusha doesn't end there, because in the next year of 2006, there's this movement called Free Arusha, whose goal is to free the country of Arusha from the ISAF interim government and restore its independence. ISAF, on the other hand, it draws up another operation called Operation Gatina, whose goal is to destroy Free Arusha. And who do they call to participate in this operation? Of course, our Lord and Savior, Mobius One. Welcome back. Here is your current sit rep. Thanks to the valiant efforts of Mobius Squadron and the ISAF, Erusia accepted the terms of surrender and the Continental War came to a close. However, militant factions led primarily by high-ranking officers of the Erusian Air Force have refused the disarmament order. They're now calling themselves Free Erusia, and the strength of their resistance increases daily. Free Erusia have called for steadfast resistance from the remaining forces in each area and have finally succeeded in capturing an old military factory, acquiring a large quantity of weapons. And this all happens in the arcade mode of Ace Combat 5, Mobius One goes there single-handedly and destroys pretty much everyone. And as far as we know, that is the end of the story for Arusia prior to Ace Combat 7. And now, let's talk about Ace Combat 5. Red alert! I was in the sky, trying to get the training team in my viewfinder from the rear seat of the lead plane. My pilot in the front seat was howling at the earth below. Give me a break, I'm babysitting nuggets up here. Command room to Wardock Squadron. We have leakers, aircraft type unknown. Crossing the border are Keith Landers, bearing 278 to 302. Captain Bartlett, your flight is the only group close enough to make the intercept. Ace Hunt 5 takes place in the year of 2010, where the world was in peace, and you know, even the countries of Ossia and Yuktobani, the two superpowers, they had a Cold War before, but for now, they were just like acting like friends, it was all chill, bro, it was all good. However, because it was so good, Ossia decided just to slash their military budget because they didn't need it. And they just poured all that money into space development and all that kind of stuff. However, some unknown fighters start entering Ossian airspace and causing some trouble. And that is where the events of Ace 15 5 start. We play as Blaze, member of the War Dog Squadron of the Ossian Air Defense Force, and our job in the very beginning of the game is you know to investigate and take care of these intruding enemies that are just penetrating our airspace. As a matter of fact, already in the second mission of the game, our captain, Captain Barlett, that is, gets shot down, and what happens is, Blaze becomes the flight leader, and then he has to attack to Osea from all these incoming enemy planes. Warning still in effect. Keep your heads on a swivel. Watch out, Nagasei, they're down below us too. is an initiative by the country of Yuktobania, which declared war on Osea shortly after. And so they have these massive Pearl Harbor surprise attacks against Osea, and of course, War Dog has to get there and save their forces, including the aircraft carrier Castro that is attacked right in the beginning of the game. But of course, War Dog is there, they save the Castro, they save Osea from many other invasions from Yuktobania, and they even find out that Yuktobania has these two 
Submarine aircraft carriers capable of launching ballistic missiles known as the Synfaxi and the Rimfaxi. And so, it just a, was a bad spot for Osea. So the conflict between Osea and Yuktubunia ends up escalating. And although Yuktubunia tried to invade Osea and didn't work out, now it's time for Osea to invade Yuktubunia on an Operation Barbarossa on steroids. So Osea goes there, it does its own Normandy beach landing and starts invading Yuktubunia with a massive army. Really, it was, it was big, like you have no idea. But the one interesting thing is that Although Osea is this massive superpower, they were relying basically on only one squadron, which is the War Dog Squadron, to win all their major battles for them. Now, one of the things you should know about Ace 15 is that it's a very peace-promoting game, and the members of the War Dog Squadron, even though they're fighting against all the odds that they have, they're still fighting for peace, and they want to find a solution for this war between Osea and Yuktobanya. So what happens is, they find out that the war between Osea and Yuktobanya had actually been caused by Belka, which was that country they defeated in Ace Combat Zero that I mentioned before. And so they find out that Belka is just creating this war between the two countries just for revenge because it was just a prank! And then the War Dog Squad tries to tell the truth to all the people who are involved in the conflict, but they find out that the Belkans had infiltrated both the Yeosian and Yuktobanian armies. Is that really true? Bartlett turned out to be a spy. So, who are you really? This way! I don't know who it is, but someone's trying to widen the rift between the two countries and keep this war going. If Osea continues to win, then the war will be over. And they're after us to prevent that? You're kidding! You people are the pillar of morale for the entire Osean army now. However, the War Dog Squadron managed to escape from their base using some trainer jets. And to make their escape plan, they even ditched their planes in the middle of the sea, so the Belkans think that they were shot down. But then when you think everything was lost, the members of the War Dog Squadron, they get rescued by guess who? The aircraft carry caster, which they helped right in the beginning of the game. And from then on, the War Dog Squadron starts to operate from the carrier caster in some ghost operations, you know, to try and restore the peace between the two countries. From this stage on, they receive a new name called the Rosgris and even a new emblem as part of their secret operations. And they go on to rescue some key people to find an end to the conflict and to punish the Belkans who created all the conflict just because it was a prank. In the end, both Ose and Yuktubanya make the peace, however, the Belkans still had some plans to them. The Belkans had controlled a satellite capable of shooting weapons of mass destruction basically nukes that they wanted to destroy all the two countries just for the fun of it. However, Ross Grease goes there and destroys them and pretty much saves the world. And that is the end of Ace Command 5. Ross Grease returns, this time as a great hero. So this leaves us with a 9 year period from the end of Ace Combat 5 to the beginning of Ace Combat 7. How the events play out, we're not so sure about that. Osea is this massive superpower and it's sad that Osea built this space elevator in this period in the continent of Yuzia, something that Erujia did not like very much. And Erujia from the end of Ace Combat 4 was just this government under ISAF rule because they lost the war. How they became a kingdom, which because they were fascists in the beginning. We don't know yet, but we're gonna see more details in Ace Combat 7. You get the broad perspective, I will talk more about this transition from the other Ace Combat games to the new Ace Combat games in part 2 of this video, and I hope you have enjoyed. If you have the chance, please do take a look at the Ace Combat stuff and lore. I put the link in the description, you can find like some helpful links, even for you new players, it's gonna be perfect for you. Hope you have enjoyed. If you wanna learn more about Ocean and Erujia in more detail than I just mentioned, 
can check these two videos here. They are basically documentaries about these two countries. Hope you have enjoyed, that you learned something, and thank you for watching, and see you guys next time.